Welcome to Northeast Conference Football Digest. I'm Ralph Ventry, and it's time to prepare for a busy week three on the NEC Gridiron. Duquesne is idle, but the six other teams are in action. So let's get to work and look at three storylines for each of Saturday's six matchups. We start in central New York, where the Wagner Seahawks will make the trip up from Staten Island to take on the Syracuse Orange, 4 p.m. kickoff on ESPN3. Let's dive into this matchup and look at three key storylines. First, Wagner is taking a step up in class with this one. For the second straight year, the Seahawks will face an FBS member. Last year, Wagner gave Florida Atlantic a run for its money, taking the Owls down to the wire, falling 7-3 in week one in Boca Raton. Storyline number two. Playing on the road against an ACC member is no easy task. That means Wagner has to be sure to limit its mistakes on Saturday. The Seahawks were victimized by an opening kickoff return for a touchdown in week two and turned the ball over on a few other occasions. They'll have to clean that up if they want to compete with the Cuse come Saturday. Storyline number three. Hey. You never know, folks. Sure, this matchup is heavily tilted in Syracuse's favor when one looks at it on paper. The Orange are playing at home, they have more scholarships than Wagner, and they have never lost to an FCS opponent in their history. The Orange are a perfect 11-0 against teams from the football championship subdivision. It may be a bit dangerous to dismiss Wagner right off the bat, however, as the Seahawks have some premier playmakers, especially running back Dominique Williams, and they will certainly be hungry for a victory come Saturday after falling to Merrimack at home in week two. Next, we go to Harrisonburg, Virginia. You may remember we were down there in week one for Central Connecticut's opener at nationally ranked James Madison. Well, in week three, it's the St. Francis Red Flash against the JMU Dukes. Three storylines for this one. For the second straight week, the Flash play on the road against the former FCS national champion. The Flash, who fell at Georgia Southern in week two, now turn their attention toward the Dukes who handled Central Connecticut State 38-14 in week one. You can bet that Chris Valerio and his staff have been pouring over that CCSU JMU game film to prepare for Saturday. Storyline number two. Will the Red Flash be able to use their run game to control the clock down at JMU? One thing that St. Francis did well in week two against Georgia Southern was run the football. Veteran back Kyle Harbridge went over 100 yards and his first game played since the 2011 season. Sophomore running back Kahari Dixon, well he scored two touchdowns for the flag. Getting the ground game going will go a long way in a possible upset of JMU. It won't be easy, though, because the Dukes bottled up Central Connecticut's preseason All-American, Rob Holloman, back in the season opener. But we'll see if the Red Flash can control the clock and pull off the upset this weekend in Harrison. Storyline number three. How about a role reversal for the Red Flash? Last week, St. Francis was the victim of a number of long plays to the Georgia Southern offense. On Saturday, let's see if the Flash can turn that around with Kyle Harbridge and company making the big plays on the offensive side of the ball. At the very least, the longer that the Red Flash had the football, 
the less time and chances James Madison has to pull off the big play. The next game on the docket takes us up to Orono, Maine, where Bryant will take on the CAA member Black Bears. Three storylines for this one. First, what an opportunity for the Bulldogs. At 2-0, they can make a statement with what would be a landmark victory over the Black Bears. Former Bryant quarterback Mike Kroos said it best when he sent out this tweet following the Bulldogs win over Assumption. The proud alumnus was certainly thrilled with Bryant's performance against Assumption, but recognized that it's a real test this weekend at CAA member Maine. After all, the Black Bears are quite an imposing opponent. In week two, they beat FBS member UMass. The meeting will be the third between Bryant and the Black Bears, as they've met each of the past two years with Maine winning both games. Storyline number two. Playing effective football in all phases of the game. That was certainly the case for Bryant back in week two. The Bulldogs dismantled Assumption College, getting contributions from all areas of its football team. From Jose DePadua scooping up a blocked punt and returning it for a touchdown, to the defense forcing turnovers, to Mike Westerhouse and the offense marching up and down the field, Saturday's victory over Assumption had to make Bryant's coaches smile. Storyline number three for Bryant at Maine. Keep an eye on the Bulldogs to see if their other weapons keep emerging. Sure, going into the season, we all knew about quarterback Mike Westerhouse and all-star receiver Jordan Harris, but it takes more than that to win football games. Thus far, Bryant has been getting contributions from some other folks on offense. Running back Ricardo McCray went over the 100-yard rushing mark for a second straight week in the win over Assumption. Fellow back Paul Canaveri has been making contributions as well. We'll see if those two men can continue their development and we'll see if any other weapons emerge when Bryant faces Maine on Saturday at 3.30. We're halfway through the week three docket here on NEC Football Digest. Now it's time to move on to matchup number four. This one is out in Moon Township, Pennsylvania at Joe Walton Stadium, where the Robert Morris Colonials will host the Dayton Flyers of the Pioneer League. Three storylines for Robert Morris and Dayton. Number one, can the Colonials get some revenge for Steel City football. Last week, fellow NEC member and Steel City rival Duquesne lost to Dayton at Welcome Stadium in Ohio. The Dukes dropped a 23-20 decision in a game that they led 20-14 at halftime. Robert Morris, however, may not be that concerned about getting revenge on Duquesne's behalf, but they probably want it on their own behalf. The Colonials have lost to Dayton each of the last four years. Three of the decisions, though, they were only by a touchdown. Storyline number two, can the Robert Morris defense contain Will Bardo? Dayton's quarterback totaled 250 yards of offense in last week's win over Duquesne, and he ran for two touchdowns. He didn't put up gaudy numbers, but every time Dayton needed a big play to move the chains, Bardo produced. The Colonial's success on defense will start with how they do against Will Bardo. Storyline number three, field position, field position, field position. It certainly benefited Robert Morris in their week two win over Morgan State. 
just as lopsided as the 31 to 14 score was Robert Morris's advantage in field position. While visiting Morgan State, on average started at its own 23 yard line, Robert Morris's drives started at their own 46, only 54 yards away from the end zone. One of the reasons why Robert Morris was able to obtain such good field position, well, that would be the punt return skills of cornerback Antoine Eddy. Returning punts for the first time in his career this season, Eddy returned four kicks for 96 yards last Saturday, that second in Robert Morris's single game history. Next, we go to New Britain, Connecticut, where the Central Connecticut State Blue Devils will host Patriot League member Holy Cross. Three storylines for Holy Cross at CCSU. First, again, it's the NEC against the Patriot League. Teams from the two peer rival conferences have squared off four times this year, with the NEC taking three of those matchups. The lone loss? Well, that came in week two, when Central Connecticut watched a 37-17 lead evaporate in the fourth quarter against Lehigh. The Blue Devils eventually fell to the Mountain Hawks 51-44 in a wild two-overtime affair. Storyline number two. Look to see if Central Connecticut's defense can limit the big pass plays on Saturday when they face Holy Cross. Run defense shouldn't be much of a problem for CCSU as they performed quite well against Lehigh, limiting the Mountain Hawks to only 105 yards on the ground. On the other hand, Saturday's opponent, Holy Cross, has struggled rushing the football. In week one at Bryant, the Crusaders were held to negative three yards rushing. But they threw for over 300 yards in the air. CCSU will have to guard against the big pass come Saturday. And storyline number three for Holy Cross at Central Connecticut. While Holy Cross has shown it can move the ball through the air on offense, the Crusaders have struggled stopping opponents from doing the same. In week one, Bryant's Mike Westerhouse went for over 300 yards in the air against the Crusaders. That should bode well for Central Connecticut starting quarterback Nick San Giacomo. Receiving the start at Lehigh last week, San Giacomo stepped up throwing for 225 yards and three touchdowns. Each of the three touchdowns, well, they went to different receivers with Scott Benzig, Tyrell Holmes, and Denzel Jones all finding pay dirt. And we're almost there, folks. One final matchup to preview on this week's edition of NEC Football Digest. This game takes us to Fairfield, Connecticut, where Sacred Heart will open up the home slate against Division II Lincoln University from Pennsylvania. Three storylines for Lincoln at Sacred Heart. First, the Pioneers have to guard against the letdown. Sacred Heart is 2-0 for the first time since 2008, feeling extremely good about itself after last week's thriller at Lafayette. The Pioneers posted a last second win on a 42 yard field goal by Alec Finney and are no doubt riding high into the home opener. Just because Lincoln is a division two opponent does not mean that they're not dangerous. The Pioneers will have to bring their A game again to make this a happy home opener at Campus Field. Storyline number two. It's the Sacred Heart secondary against Lincoln wide receiver Akeem Jordan. The unit is the most experienced on the club and has a number of playmakers, including cornerback Stephen Thomas, whose two interceptions and forced fumble in the week two win over Lafayette landed him national 
FCS Co-Defensive Player of the Week honors from the Sports Network. Thomas and company will have a tough task in defending Akeem Jordan. In last week's season opener, Jordan caught three touchdown passes and gained 114 yards receiving. Storyline number three. Can the Sacred Heart rushing attack carry the Pioneers to yet another victory? The Pioneers have been phenomenal in the run game thus far this season. Just take a look at last week's game against Lafayette. Bruising tailback Kashada Spence averaged more than nine yards per carry against the Leopards. And then there's rookie quarterback RJ Noel. For the second straight week, Noel has gone over the 100-yard rushing mark in each of his first two collegiate starts. The Lafayette defense found out just how explosive he was on this 66-yard touchdown run. So that'll just about do it for our Week 3 edition of Northeast Conference Football Digest. Six NEC teams are in action, all playing against non-conference opponents. You can watch three of the matchups live and free of charge right here on NEC Front Row. Dayton at Robert Morris, Holy Cross at Central Connecticut, and Lincoln at Sacred Heart will all air live on the NEC's digital network. You can also catch Wagner on the web as their game against Syracuse, which kicks off at 4 p.m., will air live on ESPN3 and the Watch ESPN app. So there you have it, folks. Enjoy week three of the NEC on the gridiron. I'm Ralph Ventry, and this was NEC Football Digest.